I'm Jeremy Myers. I'm the fellowship director at the uh, University of Utah. And so I had planned on kind of uh, going through and introducing you to our fellows uh, here and then uh, also to Ben McCormick and have them kind of introduce themselves. And then uh, I'd love to hear where you're coming from and, and get an introduction to yourself. And then I was going to talk about uh, 20 minutes or so kind of about our program at Utah and, and what, what aspects of it are, are unique or are strengths of the program. And then I'm probably gonna get off uh, and allow you to kind of talk to Kevin and talk to Rano, uh, our current fellows about, uh, you know, what their experience is like uh, at Utah, ask questions um, of them. Um, so thanks for joining us, number one. Uh, it's really great to have you here and I'm really excited to talk to you about what we have to offer here. So I'm Jeremy, as I said, uh, I've been here, this is my 13th year at University of Utah and I came here out of fellowship. I completed fellowship with um, Dr. Mackinich at uh, UCSF, which amazingly was one of about five fellowships in the country at the time. And now you all are very aware of how many uh, fellows there are here. Um, so, uh, or how many fellowships there are. Um, so it's amazing what's happened to GU reconstruction. Um, I, we started the fellowship uh, about six years ago. I think we've had six graduating fellows. Um, we've moved to a two-year fellowship. And so uh, Rano is uh, our current um, more second year fellow, although he's the last one year fellow. And Kevin, uh, who's on the call, is our first uh, two year fellow. Ben McCormick joined us uh, this year and he completed the fellowship uh, last year. So, uh, Kevin and Ben, uh, why don't you introduce yourself and hopefully Rayno will join. I'm sure he's busy uh, doing something right now. Yeah, hey, um, I'm Ben McCormick. Um, like Dr. Meyer said, I'm um, graduated from um, the GERS Fellowship this past year and stayed on as faculty, um, doing a lot of gender affirming surgery and uh, um, some robotics and some general reconstruction. i um, been really, really enjoying it. Um, and I think, you know, as you'll see, I think it's a really, really very well-rounded program. I think probably more to offer here than you'll find in most anywhere. So um, happy to talk to you now or Later, um, we'll give you, of course, our emails and and um, feel free to reach out to me at any point. Kevin, everyone, uh, my name is Kevin Abear. I'm uh, the first year GERS Fellow, University of Utah, and I did um, uh, residency at uh, Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and I'm originally from Louisiana. So excited to meet all of you um, and answer questions uh, later on. Rana, do you mind uh, introducing yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is Rano Mata. I'm the second year GRS fellow here in Utah. Um, last year, I was able to do a one year pediatrics fellowship here in Utah as well in the primary children's hospital. Um, and I'm originally from uh, Toronto, Ontario, Canada. I did my residency there and uh, also very excited to meet all of you and, and sort of answer any questions you might have. And uh, Liz, would you mind introducing yourself to the most important person on this call? Um, hey, sorry, I'm trying to fix my video here. Um, my name is Liz. I'm the fellowship coordinator for the um, GERS as well as the Andrology Men's um, Health and you guys will be either talking to me or <laughs> working with me to set up interviews, et cetera. So once everything is set and done, so. Oh, fantastic. Thanks for introducing all of yourselves. I appreciate it. Um, well, uh, let me uh, jump into kind of this presentation that I made uh, for you. Okay, so um, talk about our program, obviously. Um, one thing about Utah is that we've experienced incredible growth at the University of Utah. And I think that you can probably relate that there are some academic programs that are kind of contracting and becoming smaller and smaller programs. And then there are some that are kind of in a growth stage. 
And I think being in a growth stage puts you in a very powerful uh, environment where there's a lot of energy. There's a lot of new people coming with new ideas. Our, our staff has expanded uh, twofold over the last 10 years. We currently have 21 faculty and three PhD basic scientists, you know, a multitude of uh, advanced practice uh, providers, et cetera. And we cover the gamut of all of the subspecialties within neurology. We have a separate cancer center. That's an NCI cancer center. Um, we have andrology, men's health and infertility. That's very robust. We're physically attached to a separate pediatric hospital that has uh, the only pediatric hospital in this area and has five pediatric urologists. We have an expert in female pelvic medicine, and then obviously um, I'm proud of the reconstruction that we have. So our training environment, we have we take three residents per year. Um, fellows, we have two in reconstructive urology. We only take one per year, so it's a two-year fellowship. So the fellows are offset by a year. So we graduate one per year and take one per year. There's one Andrology Men's Health and Fertility Fellowship Fellow, a Pediatric Urology Fellow, and now we have an Oncology Fellow. We cover four main hospitals, uh, University of Utah, the Salt Lake City VA, uh, which the fellows do not go to, but is about uh, a mile away. Primary Children's Hospital is, uh, you know, physically attached to us by a bridge, as well as the Huntsman Cancer Hospital. And then Intermountain Healthcare is a place that the residents go to, and it's very analogous to Kaiser, uh, if you're familiar with that, in Colorado and in California. One of the really unique parts of being in Utah is that we cover a vast geographic area. Um, and some people will say it's about 5 to 10% of the geographic United States is covered by University of Utah. Um, this is the Intermountain West, which is where University of Utah falls. Uh, we don't cover all of that, obviously, um, but uh, there's a, you know, a geographic kind of divide, the Rocky Mountains that separates us from Colorado, and then the other geographic divide of the Sierra Nevadas separating us from kind of Eastern or, or Western Oregon, Western Washington and Western California where other programs are. And so that creates this very unique environment where we actually live in a relatively small city uh, which has plenty to do, but uh, is a very easy place to live. And yet we get a, a, a lot of pathology here that is very, very interesting. Because if you have bad problems and you live in Idaho, Wyoming, Montana, you're, you're coming to University of Utah for your, your care because there simply are no medical centers that really service those areas. So that, that aspect of uh, this place is unique. Unlike some cities where there may be uh, very robust training programs, but maybe the training programs compete for different types of patients and have an expertise like one program is the radical cystectomy program. One program does, you know, gender affirmation surgery. The, this geographic isolation has created a situation where we really have to provide all these services at a very high level and thus the training environment uh, reflects that. Um, we've had a lot of growth in the medical center. <clears throat> this is the Huntsman Cancer Institute, and it's kind of grown over time, kind of right at the foothills. Uh, we're adding on this phase five now, which is a women's center. And we go up there in reconstruction and do urinary diversions uh, periodically for both the uh, gynonks and then also for the uro-oncology uh, service. This is our newest ambulatory care center. And so we have an ambulatory care operating room uh, here uh, with uh, six ORs. And then also we have very contemporary clinic space that's nice to work in with urodynamics, fluoroscopy, kind of all the typical things that you'd find in a modern urology clinic and a really nice environment that patients really like and uh, clinicians like a lot too. Um, one of the aspects at, at Utah is uh, rehabilitation services and neurogenic bladder. Um, this is the new, this is the artist rendition, but the new Nielsen Rehabilitation Hospital. 
And so the rehab department covers about 3,000 spinal cord injury patients in the Andrew Mountain West. And they kind of have a medical home uh, for these patients where they take care of all their primary care needs as well as their rehab needs. So we're seeing spinal cord injury patients all the time to talk about bladder management and do surgery uh, when surgery is needed on them. So that's kind of how it looks overall. In the background, you kind of see the huntsman right up against the mountains. And then this arrow uh, over here is the new Nielsen Rehabilitation Center. This is our ambulatory care center and clinic. And then this is our main hospital. That's like most hospitals, it's kind of organically grown over time. And I think it's about 750 beds. So it's a moderate sized uh, uh, center. So, you know, one of the things that we kind of did is uh, took this sort of leap of faith uh, to make this a two-year fellowship. And uh, Kevin can certainly talk about that uh, transition being the first two-year fellow. And, you know, there's obviously these three components to fellowship training and academic centers in general. It's teaching, it's research uh, at some academic centers, some more than less. And then it's clinically excellent training or clinical excellence in, in programs. And the concept of a two-year fellowship is to really expand your training in these areas. And reconstruction has become so complex and it covers so many different areas. The evolution has just been amazing over the course of the last uh, decade that I really think in a, in a program like this where we offer all of these areas and we also offer uh, really robust research and teaching experience that a two-year fellowship allows people to really take advantage of that. Having said that, you can get excellent one-year training at many programs, as you guys know, across the country. And so this is for the right fellow. And who is the right fellow? You know, I think it's someone that really wants to learn uh, complex reconstruction very thoroughly. Someone that wants to be able to come out of the fellowship and confidently take care of radiated uh, abdomen patients, redo surgery, which most of the abdominal surgery we're doing has some component of that. Uh, be able to be very competent at gender affirmation surgery, and then all of the other aspects of uh, kind of what encompasses reconstructive urology, such as neurogenic bladder, congenitalism, transitional care, all of those things. It's a place where you will operate a lot. You will gain independent autonomy over time and really learn how to teach in the OR because you're working with residents in the OR and you're expected to learn how to and become very good at mentoring them through uh, the, the process. It's a place where you really will get a very robust research experience and really be able to pursue a lot of research that you're interested in a lot of educational objectives that you have an interest in, not necessarily are just our interests. We're very open and we really want you to kind of come forward with projects and ideas about what best serves your goals long-term in education. So this place is an academic springboard is the way that we're thinking about it. You know, if you, if you think, hey, I love doing reconstruction, I wanna kind of go to a big group and do urethral strictures and sphincters and, and that kind of thing and become well-trained in that, you know, this is probably not the environment for you. You know, those, those fellowships with one year kind of emphases in those areas are really excellent training. So that's why we've transitioned to this two-year uh, program. You know, what are the numbers? This is kind of an example from Ross, and I'm sorry, I didn't put in Ben's numbers, but they're comparable to last year. The big highlights are urinary diversion, open reconstruction, and now robotic reconstruction with Ben, and that's one of his big emphases. So you can see a urethral reconstruction. Uh, we did uh, about 75 uh, total, and the required amount is 60. And we're usually between 60 to 80 urethroplasties a year. I'd probably say that's a little bit more now. Urinary diversion with open reconstruction. 
Uh, we did 67 cases. Um, and so a huge experience in kind of urinary diversion, uh, ureter work, complex ureter work. A lot of those patients uh, have radiation injury or redo urinary diversion. Um, so great experience in that. And then uh, another highlight is gender affirmation surgery. Of course, COVID like threw a wrench into the works with a lot of these sort of elective, uh, uh, somewhat elective cases. But we should be doing about 40 to 60 vaginoplasties a year and 12 to 15 phalloplasties or mctoidoplasties a year. So it's a very robust, well-developed program. And that program's been going for about four years now. And Ben can talk a little bit about what the experience is like for fellows and residents. So our transgender health program, as I mentioned, it's been going for about four years and we started off pretty slow, but currently we do 1.5 block days a week. Um, and so that means uh, translates to about two to three vaginoplasties a week or one phalloplasty, one vaginoplasty, some combination of that uh, going on every week. So uh, that's a Tuesday every other week and that's how it comes out to 1.5 uh, uh, times a week. Um, we, we took this as a, a team approach because uh, we knew that it could be pretty overwhelming surgical volume uh, once things uh, built up. And also uh, the collaboration that we have with plastic surgery is very good here. And there are a couple of plastic surgeons that are very passionate about this work. And so there are two plastic surgeons, Corey Agarwal and then Isaac Goodwin. Isaac Goodwin did a fellowship uh, in microvascular flaps at the Bunky Clinic, which is a very famous clinic in San Francisco for phalloplasty. So he has a lot of expertise in that. And then I work once a month now uh, doing transgender um, and gender affirmation surgery. And then uh, Ben McCormick uh, works uh, three, out of, three weeks out of uh, four. And then Jim Hotailing, our andrology men's health expert, uh, works also uh, two days out of the two of those block days out of the month. So it's three urologists total. And so you'd kind of mix in between fellows, kind of exchanging which days are covered by a fellow. And the men's health fellow uh, covers some of these days. And then the reconstructive urology fellows uh, split up the rest of the days uh, over time. This is the team. So what about research? I mean, I think that's a huge strength of coming here if you have an interest in research, and many of you obviously do. We've had a bunch of grants over time and been really successful with that uh, throughout different aspects of urology. In reconstructive urology, we had a Pete Corey Award uh, looking at quality of life. Um, with bladder management strategies and spinal cord injury, and then also a Department of Defense grant. Um, one of the resources that we kind of invested in early was creating positions for research fellows. And so currently we have two research fellows, one who's split between pediatrics and adult urology and reconstruction, and one who's in oncology. And these are uh, people that either elect to take an additional year to uh, get an experience in research before they apply to urology residency, or they're unfortunate and they don't match in urology and they still want to pursue urology. Or sometimes people that are trained elsewhere come to the U.S. and uh, have aspirations of becoming a urologist in the U.S. and spend time doing research. And the reason I mentioned these um, uh, individuals is that they provide a lot of resources uh, for uh, doing collaborative research within the division, and uh, they're very valuable. Um, we have a lot of collaborations. Um, I uh, was one of the founding members of the TURNS Network, which is about 14 centers in the U.S. And, you know, that's kind of flagged a bit as far as its productivity, but there's still a lot of very dedicated members and a huge database that can be used to answer some clinical questions in a retrospective kind of fashion. And it's a great contact network as well. And then I also helped start the Neurogenic Bladder Research Group. 
which now has uh, about 12 members also in the US and Canada. And that's a really active group that's been very successful with grants, uh, looking at various aspects of neurogenic bladder uh, research and, uh, and management. Um, uh, we also were the site that started this AAST uh, multi-institutional genital urinary trauma study uh, that was in association with the American Association for Surgery and Trauma. And so we published a lot on the renal trauma, some on bladder trauma, and now we're bringing out a couple publications about uh, pelvic fracture urethral injury. And so that's a really rich resource. We have this uh, data set of, uh, you know, about 1,100 high-grade renal trauma uh, patients with all of their radiology, a lot of the clinical details about their management and outcome. And so there's really a lot of projects that can be done with that. Rano has been working on a project looking at how we could change AAST grading in a way that maybe it would be a little more meaningful for clinical outcomes. Um, we also collaborate uh, with a health services research um, division that's through uh, the um, Department of Surgery, and they have a number of these health services research databases, such as um, Market Scan, the National Trauma Data Bank, um, something called the Trauma Quality Improvement Project, a bunch of inpatient kind of databases that are available. So there's a lot of health services research uh, stuff that can be done uh, during your time here as well. There's a lot of resources for doing that research. So one thing is for sure is that we don't expect you to be a statistical expert and figure out how to do health services research analysis and data acquisition. You know, we work with a team to do that. And so you get, you, you kind of propose this project, develop it with a, this team of biostaticians, and uh, epidemiologists come up with a statistical analysis plan, and then you get the statistical results and you talk about those results with a team, see where it's kind of an error or can be explored a little bit more with reanalysis, and then you write the paper based on that. And so it's not, it's not something where this is just something you have to do and we have these resources. You know, we have the resources to make these projects successful and push them through the finish line where you're not having to do that other than kind of the essential parts of it. This is that surgical population analysis research core that they call SPARC, which is a health services research uh, kind of section within uh, the Department of Surgery, which we're a part of at University of Utah. So the way I've conceived this two-year program is that people would generally choose some scholar track. And this isn't a, you know, you don't have to go into a certain track. It's more of an idea of framing the type of educational opportunities you could have. So Kevin, uh, has uh, pursued a master's of clinical investigation um, and of science and clinical investigation, which is a really common thing for people to do. And so he'll graduate here with a master's degree, master's project uh, during his two year time frame. And, you know, that'd be a common track for people to take. And there's an opportunity to do a master's degree if you wanted to within that track, but you certainly don't have to do that. It's really up to your personal goals. You could do a global health track. We have an excellent global health division in the Department of Surgery, and we have a very close collaboration with IVU Med. I used to be on the board of IVU Med, and IVU Med was started at University of Utah. And so there's very close ties there. So you could do, for instance, an MPH or projects within global health that were focused on whatever you were interested in. You could consider a leadership track. And a leadership track, I could envision you doing a master's of business administration. There's an executive master's degree here that a lot of people will do later in their career as they go up sort of the administrative ladder. But that's something that you could do early on if you said, hey, you know what? I wanna be a chair, that's my goal. I love reconstruction, I wanna stay in academics. I want to be a chair and executive leadership would serve me so well right now uh, to start off early in my career. We could talk about how to do that. You could emphasize education. 
our incoming fellow, Liam, is very interested in education, especially surrounding transgender issues and access to care. And they are going to do uh, some specialized courses through the American College of Surgeons focused on education that we're kind of supporting. So there's a lot of opportunities for these types uh, for you to identify what you're interested in doing for your education and then pursuing that during your fellowship and having the time to do that and the resources to do that. Depending on what you do, you know, we have to discuss how to get it done and et cetera, but I'm very open to kind of understanding what that is and facilitating it. And this comes back to the overall philosophy that I have. You know, I want to be one of the best fellowship training spots in the country for people that are headed towards academics and have these, uh, these goals in mind. In order to do that, we have to create an educational program that will attract the highest quality fellows that have that in their mind as their goal. And in order to do that, we really have to create this program that allows a lot of freedom in your education. And so that's really critical to the overall success of the program and the success of you as a candidate and a fellow and a future potential academic person. Not to say that you have to go into academics from this program, that's certainly not, but I think that's you know, a, a strength that we offer as a springboard for that. So this is the MSCI that I kind of talked about a little bit. You can do health leadership sort of classes during your year and not do a master's. There's a lot of these offerings like many medical centers have. This is a mini program that's 12 days. And I certainly open up and send these emails to fellows all the time saying, hey, this would be a great program if you were interested in doing it. So international programs, you know, we, I mentioned this close collaboration. This is Phil, one of our fellows. Uh, from back when we could actually travel somewhere, um, which hopefully will be coming again soon. And so I, I, I offer the fellows one trip during their time uh, in fellowship that's sponsored by the uh, division and expense of the fellowship to go for one or two weeks on an international trip. And I, I really want the fellows to apply for the GURS uh, program to do that. Um, but if they don't get into that program or it doesn't suit the timing, et cetera, then they're free to kind of be sponsored and, and paid for to go on an IVU med reconstructive urology trip. So uh, that's a great uh, benefit of being here too. I, I would really encourage that. So Salt Lake is, you know, fairly affordable. Of course, everywhere has gotten more expensive. This is data from a couple of years ago, kind of pre-COVID or in the midst of COVID, and obviously prices have gone up. I'm from Boston, so I put that there. So the average rent, $1,500, kind of roughly comparable to the United States, certainly more expensive than some places, but way less expensive than any, you know, really urban center like Chicago, New York, San Francisco, et cetera. Um, you know, an aspect of being in Utah is that it is amazing. Um, and I think Kevin and Rano can kind of talk about this some, um, all of the national parks. So for instance, Arches and Moab is three and a half hours away. And so it's easy to go there for a weekend if you want to get away. Um, the skiing, when I came in and interviewed, they told me that you could be skiing in 30 minutes. And I said, that's gotta be bullshit, you know, there's no way. And I drove up there and it was 27 minutes to the base of Alta from uh, Salt Lake. So if you like doing these outdoor things, spending your time outdoors with whatever activity you like, Salt Lake is a great place to be because things are just so accessible and it has such a healthy outdoor culture. There's lots of city things to do here too. It's a great little city. You can get a beer, you can go out and get cocktails. You know, it's, it's a good place to live. This is one of the um, new, the new Performing Arts Center, the Rice Eccles Center, which has, you know, all of the off-Broadway kind of plays that come and a variety of really interesting things that you can go see. Of course, you know, skiing, these are some of the 
things that I've done over time, everyone from Utah always puts in all their outdoor pictures that they like into their presentations. This is Jim hoteling and his kids and my kids canoeing in, in uh, Desolation Canyon, which is down uh, near Moab. And we do a uh, llama trip every year, hiking up into the Wind Rivers in Wyoming, which is about four hours away. And this is a scene from one of our camping sites uh, on that uh, llama hiking trip. And uh, Jim and I are doing some mountain biking. And this is uh, just a hike in the back of the Huntsman. Um, so it takes about 35 minutes to get up to this point. And this is the view that you get if you get an afternoon off or need to go out for some uh, fresh air. So this is a, just a great place to be for that aspect as well as the training. So um, thanks for listening to that. Um, I would love to hear any questions that you have for me or anything else you'd like me to talk about a little bit more. And then uh, I'll turn this over to kind of the, the fellows and maybe ask Ben to answer any questions or give any feedback about being here as a fellow and now as a faculty. So do any of you guys have questions that you want to ask? I have one quick question, which is just, um, could you talk about where your last couple of years worth of fellows are now? That's a great question. Um, so um, our, uh, Ben obviously took a position here uh, and interviewed kind of across the US uh, at a variety of places and can kind of talk a little bit about the uh, job market uh, as far as that goes. Um, our previous fellow was uh, Ross Anderson. And so he ultimately decided that his passion was not in academics and he wanted to go to a place where he could really practice uh, independently uh, doing reconstruction. And so he found a great opportunity in Reno and so there's a very large LUGPA type group that has maybe 20 urologists in Reno. And there's no really academic, there is center there obviously, but uh, I think a lot of the care there is taken care of by this system. And so he does all the reconstruction for that system. So he does a lot of robotics. He does a lot of really advanced reconstruction there simply because of the lack of an academic sort of urology center. And they really are the de facto center for all the care around Reno. Um, before that, we've had a, a fellow that uh, left Phil and he works in infertility. And that's when we had the infertility and the reconstructive fellowship merged and they were kind of together. And so Phil was much more interested in infertility and men's health than maybe some of the abdominal reconstruction, et cetera. And so he went to a large private practice group in New Jersey where he was from, and he does infertility care there for an REI group called RMA. Um, prior to that, we had uh, Rachel Moses. She's an assistant professor at Dartmouth and, and doing a lot of great work there. Can you maybe talk about day-to-day, um, -day, I guess, from year one or and year two? Is it, uh, you know, mostly OR, mostly clinic, and then does that change year to year? So that's a great question. One thing that I realized just personally and also modeling this based on our pediatrics fellowship a little bit is that coming out of training, nobody wants to do a research, a full research year. You know, on one hand, it might be kind of a nice break. On the other hand, you know, I mean, you're very well trained at that point and you want to start learning independence. And so rather than having a research year and then a clinical year, kind of like a lot of fellowships are structured, say oncology, et cetera, we decided to blend the years. And so we certainly expect you to be spending more time on your educational objectives like completing coursework and the Master's of Clinical Investigation for Kevin during his first year. Uh, he is also clinically active. And so he does a day of clinic and then he's in the operating room one or one and a half or two days a week, depending on the week and depending on his class schedule. 
are very cognizant of the need for him to do his classes and have adequate time for coursework and research. So there's not strictly a research and clinical year, but the second year we'd expect you to be more clinically active. So say you were pretty intensive on your educational objectives and you really wanted to get a master's degree. Then maybe in your first year, you'd be working two days a week clinically, three days a week on research and education. And then in your second year, depending on your course load and your desire and how much experience, you might do three or four days clinical and one or two days doing research. So that's how it looks on a day to day. You know, we roughly split the fellowship. And so uh, I think first year fellows on average will be working more with Ben McCormick, but not exclusively. And then second year fellows will likely be working more with me but definitely not exclusively. And I certainly don't feel heavy handed about assigning fellows to be somewhere. We never need a fellow. You know, we can always be working on our own or with the residents exclusively. And so a lot of what cases are really uh, educational for the fellows, they'd certainly be very free to kind of uh, decide that and, and let us know and kind of pursue those cases. Other questions? Uh, do you have any teaching responsibilities with medical students? Um, there are no formal teaching responsibilities with medical students. We have a lot of medical students that rotate through urology. It, uh, the, they can elect to come through urology as an elective rotation, but also um, the medical school at, um, uh, increase the numbers of medical students. And for that reason, there wasn't enough surgery spots for their rotation. So we also have uh, medical students that are just on their core surgery rotation that also rotate through urology as part of that. So that, that is just the typical interactions and teaching uh, that would go on between residents, fellows, and medical students. I expect that the uh, fellows will give one or two grand rounds presentations uh, to the division and then, you know, have some other teaching, uh, you know, whatever they kind of desire with the residents, like, for instance, a case series where we talk about reconstructive cases. Ben has just started a, a journal club that we're going to do once a month with the fellows and the residents uh, will come to that too if they want to. Um, so there's other, you know, more informal and formal teaching opportunities. Anything else? Okay, Ben, if you're, if you're still there, maybe you could kind of give some comments. Uh, for just a few minutes, kind of about your experience, and then maybe I'll sign off and, and uh, uh, Rano and, uh, and uh, Kevin can kind of talk to you guys from their perspective. Yeah, happy to. Um, I think I was just reflecting during your presentation about um, kind of what if my fellowship had been two years, and I think kind of um, in my first six months of practice, I've had a lot of sweaty cases where I wish I had maybe a few more of these under my belt. And um, I think really, I mean, I, I, a bunch of colleagues who did different fellowships and in, in oncology and, and you know, robotics or endo. And I really think that if any fellowship should be two years, it should be reconstruction. As Jeremy said, it's such a large field that's growing. Um, I mean, really becoming facile um, at the breadth of reconstructive urology is, is really hard um, in a single year, especially. Um, so, you know, I think that the clinical training that you get with the additional year, in addition to the resources that come along with the program and the opportunities for, um, you know, pursuing academic pursuits um, is really an, an advantage. Um, Salt Lake City is really a wonderful place to live. Um, you know, if you get out of work early one day, you can just run up and ski or, you know, any weekend you can find tons to do in and outside of Salt Lake City. So I've really, really enjoyed it. Um, 
And, you know, one of the reasons I, I came here initially and certainly stayed on just because um, I find it a really pleasant place to work. Everyone is really wonderful to work with. And I think my priority and fellowship and, um, and staying on as faculty for better or for worse, I think was, was the social, you know, was the relationships I had here and how um, I knew how important that was to me personally and just in happiness, um, quality of life. So I think, you know, the combination of surgical training, you know, research opportunities, <clears throat> the connections that Dr. Myers has across the country for, for jobs, um, you know, that in combination with the social aspects of the university and, and working with the residents and other fellows and uh, just how great Salt Lake City and Utah is at large, I think a really compelling reasons to come. So, um, you know, it's, it's certainly, um, I think, you know, a lot of people kind of hesitated the two years and I think it's, you know, important to think about, but um, like Dr. Meyer said, this is a really, you can, you can be set up here to go anywhere. And uh, I think, uh, you know, it's, I think probably whether he admits it or not, Dr. Myers probably sweats, you know, your future more than he does his at this point. It's, it's really feels nice to be a, a priority and feel taken care of in that way. Well, any other questions that you want to ask uh, Ben or I? And maybe I'll have Ben stay on for a little bit. Yeah, well, so, uh, yeah, I like the mentor attitude that you provide, Dr. Jeremy. But the idea that I, I feel is, is, is a bit overcrowded for two years. I think, like, uh, you have a lot of research, a lot of, uh, of, uh, of surgeries in, in reconstructive urology. So I think... Uh, I mean, if it's optional for everyone to enter uh, in, in 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 operations, uh, how will you how will you make sure that everyone gets the appropriate training in every uh, part of uh, genital renal reconstruction? Well, I think it's a good concern. Um, you know, we don't have the situation where the fellows are double scrubbed. Um, the fellows here uh, have. Uh, we very much follow uh, what is really common in reconstruction, which the fellows are learning how to teach and have really a lot of graduated responsibility for teaching. And as time goes on, you know, I might be in the background, I might uh, not be around for certain aspects of the operation, come in and check certain aspects of the operation. And so they're not competing with the residents. They're really learning how to take residents through these cases and teach whatever level the residents are. And so there's not a competition dynamic there either between the fellows and the residents. Um, so there, there isn't a lot of competition for cases. There's not a lot of double scrubbing. There's just so much operating going on that, that I think that it can, it can easily support uh, the, the number of fellows that we have. Um, so, and, and also the emphases are maybe difference between the, between the years. Um, I think the numbers can kind of attest to the kind of training. And I think probably Kevin and Rano can talk about the type of experience they're having and whether it's constrained by our capacity to do operations and the number of people we have. You know, a caveat is that obviously there are fellows during a very unique time. And so we've had some constraints, you know, related to just dealing with the pandemic, less than some other medical centers, I think, but uh, still, you know, we're not operating at full uh, like we should. We've probably maintained 90%, you know, over the, over the course of the pandemic on average. So are the three or four days of clinical work uh, per week, uh, are they uh, lists uh, or are lists or uh, distributed between clinic and uh, or? Yes, so we have two clinics a week. One clinic is with myself and one clinic is with Ben McCormick. And in that clinic, there's a fellow and we need a fellow in that clinic because there's a lot of patients. So that is one sort of essential clinical thing where, you know, the fellow couldn't be gone that day. I mean, we can compensate if they're on vacation or have some commitment. 
but uh, that's a, that's a day that we really need them. And then we also have a PA working in clinic. So it's three of us. And in the clinic, we typically see, we normally, you know, pre-COVID or excluding COVID, would see about 35 to 38 patients. And so some of them are return patients, some of them are new patients. They're all reconstructive patients. Ben's clinic has been building up over time. And so he'll be seeing similar numbers. You know, I think just over time, naturally, it's taken a while for that to build up. And I think he's probably seeing about 20 patients per clinic now, especially with the COVID kind of situation and constraints that we have in staffing the clinic. Does that answer that question? And then, and then we each have two days in the operating room. Um, and then there's also other opportunities like a huff and I'll be operating off of block time to do urinary diversions or things like that that come up. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, thank you for all your time today. Uh, you were mentioning the different facilities uh, that are involved and in, you alluded to the Huntsman Cancer Institute. And I was just curious, what's the integration with the reconstruction department and how, kind of what involvement is there over there? So um, we get involved typically with more advanced reconstruction. So almost all of the guys other than one who's busy and been there for years do their own neobladders. And so we don't usually do neal bladders, but we do all of the colon pouches that are needed. Um, and we probably do about a dozen on average, some are routine eight and you know upwards of 15 per year colon pouches, either up there or down at a university for you know, radiation injury or benign reasons for urinary diversion. So we do all of the benign diversion down at the university. And then we'll also get involved with um, OBGYN and the gynonks. We have a very busy gynonk service and we do most of the diversions for them. If they just need a simple conduit, then the oncologist will do it. But we do a lot of colon conduits for them for radiation and then also some um, colon pouches. So it's, it's fairly good, well integrated. We have a good relationship with them up there. Thank you. Okay, guys, well, it's really nice to meet you all and uh, I'm gonna sign off um, and I'll keep this meeting going. Liz, is this, uh, will this keep going or will I shut it off for everybody? Um, it will keep going. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll sign off and hopefully I won't end the meeting for all of you. Uh, really a pleasure to meet y'all and very happy to get any email questions that you have. Uh, just reach out to me, to Rano, to Kevin, to Ben, uh, or to Liz at any time. Great. Nice to meet you all. I look forward to talking to y'all uh, some more. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.